Major funding for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health, including Presbyterian in Charlotte and Forsyth in Winston-Salem, are affiliate heart hospitals of the Cleveland Clinic, consistently ranked number one in the nation for heart care. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, proudly serving South Carolinians since 1946. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Well, it's not the hottest issue of the day, but most certainly global trade is among our top 10 list of key business and policy issues. I'm Chris William, and welcome again to the most widely watched source for Carolina business and public policy. Our region's role on the world trade stage is not marginal, with both North and South Carolina being net exporters of goods and services, as well as important real estate for our international trading partners like the UK. Many have said an obvious way out of the economic uncertainty is to become even more progressive with global trade activity, but how do we do that really? And what are the obstacles? Joining the dialogue later on is the United Kingdom's Consul General, Annabel Malins. Major funding also by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs. Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded April 13th, 2012. On this week's program, Bob Morgan of the Charlotte Chamber of Commerce, Kai Nitsche of Dunlop Sports Group, and special guest, Annabelle Malins, British Consul General. Now, Chris William. Hello, welcome to our program and happy spring, gentlemen, welcome. Good to have you. you here, Kai. Bob, welcome back. Thank you. Good to be here. You know, I had something else to talk about, but I know you're both coming off of, Bob, you just came out of your transportation summit uh, at the Charlotte Chamber. And Kai, I know logistics and transportation mean a little something something to uh, uh, Dunlop. So we'll, we'll, let's get right to that. Bob, give us a sense of there. there is a lot of talk. It's, a, it's certainly an important election year in North Carolina, not just the new governor, but the DNC and you know, it's a battleground state. And, and here we have, a, in 2012, we have a year where politically we're extremely active. But what happens to issues like transportation that clearly need much more than just policy talk, that need funding? How, how do you feel that's going that, to you know, kind of unfold this year? Look, we begin with the premise, the Charlotte region, 1.8 million people, going to more than double to more than 4 million over 20 years. It's a long-term challenge that we face. And a lot has happened in the last three to four years. We're seeing some major interstate projects move forward. Some have been accelerated. Uh, we're continuing to invest in our mass transit. Uh, we're very challenged at, at every level of government. Um, one of the things that we're intrigued with uh, that we can perhaps learn from the United Kingdom, uh, public-private partnerships, or they're commonly known as P3s, uh, they've been used in Europe. They're being used in the developing economies around the world, uh, much less so uh, in the United States uh, up to now, but uh, we think there's a lot to be learned there to help uh, meet the challenge of declining public revenues at a time when the needs are very great. And Kai, last week coming off a dialogue we had with Jim Newsom from the South Carolina Ports Authority, clearly we were talking about logistics and transportation, the deepening project, and, but, but once the import and export business, and we'll give you a chance to wade in here on this, the import export business gets off the ship or gets to the ship, ships in that port is the issue, and especially I-26. Um, how do you feel about South Carolina's ability to put that on a fast track and, and, and open up that cataract a little bit? Well, I'm, uh, we're, we're based in Greenville, so I-26 is extremely important for us to get, uh, you know, our, our uh, imports in from Charleston. We, uh, 
we have about 84% of our uh, full container shipments come come in from Charleston. So, uh, you know, it is an important uh, important for us as a business. So, uh, and there are lots of businesses I think in the upstate of South Carolina, um, as well as I'm sure the entire region where, where I-26 plays an important and integral role in, in getting and uh, receiving as well as shipping products. So, I would think that. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people that have a vested interest to, to certainly try and get that opened up. Do you get the sense there's an appetite politically to, to you know, we all talk about in tough times, we want education, certainly, but transportation uh, and infrastructure seems like it, it needs a little bit more attention than maybe coming out of the state house. I, I think you're right. I think, um, you know, there's been some major announcements in, in our region and uh, just with... Uh, uh, just with the automotive industry and, and some additional jobs that are going to be uh, added to, to manufacturing and some new facilities that are going to be under construction. And, and you got to think that uh, certainly there's, there's got to be some plans in place to make sure that um, the, the product's going to be able to get to and from um, the, the places that, that they need to get to. So I would think that that should be top of, top of the list in, in the state house. Uh, let's talk about jobs for just a second because you made this reference to labor. Bob, uh, labor and immigration, just, just pretty briefly here. Uh, one of the phenomena that have been noted on this program and, and in other public dialogues has been this whole issue of we've got relatively high unemployment still. It's been dropping incrementally, but we still have relatively high unemployment. But still there's this phenomenon in labor where people are, are not, uh, uh, firms are looking for qualified folks so they end up poaching workers from each other and not going to that pool of, of the unemployed. It, it, is that is that going to be a long-lived phenomenon? How do how do you look at it? Well, I think the the bottom line is if you have marketable skills, there are jobs that are going begging, whether it's in IT or or engineering. Uh, you know, Charlotte was the fastest-growing urban region in America over the last decade. A lot of people have. Uh, moved here. Uh, if you have a four-year degree, the unemployment rate is something like three or four percent. Uh, there are jobs uh, that are out there and companies are um, are going to compete for those. It is in IT, it's in professional services, uh, it's in uh, engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it sounds cliche, but if you're in the workforce and your skills are not up to date, uh, you're going to be severely challenged. As a private company, Kai, how do, how do you guys look at the labor and immigration issue? Well, I mean, I think uh, it, it is, you know, obviously a, a very important issue. I mean, I feel like um, as far as education goes in, in, in our region, in our area, we've got a very good public school system. Um, so I think from, from uh, uh, you know, a labor and, and immigration standpoint, you know, obviously you'd mentioned that, that uh, overall the unemployment, you know, still is high, but with uh, many jobs, you know, coming to this region, and it does seem to be dropping a bit, I think overall, um, you know, definitely there's a there's a labor force out there that, uh, uh, you know, has people willing willing to work and making sure that we have the right uh, people in place to, 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 to take care, take, you know, th those jobs. You know, guys, stay with us. Up next is uh, our special guest. Before we do that, since we've been talking about uh, a lot of the things that are crucial to the economic development in the region, let alone the policy issues. On this program next week, he is uh, coming back. His name is Keith Crisco, and if you know anything about uh, economic development, you know he is the head of the North Carolina Chamber of Commerce as the secretary of the chamber. Uh, I'm sorry, as the secretary of the, uh, South, uh, the North Carolina Commerce Department. Just way too many titles going on here. <laughs> Keith Crisco next week. And then in two weeks, we're calling this dialogue the knowledge economy. Norris Tolson from the North Carolina Biotech Center. Wayne Roper from, South, from SC Bio. John Harden from the Office of Science and Technology at North Carolina Commerce. And then Bill Mahoney also uh, returning to this program from the South Carolina Research Authority. You know, whether your headquarters are in Charlotte, in Columbia, in Raleigh, in Asheville, in London... You have a keen interest when it comes to your organization being not only an ongoing concern, but just competitive. In terms of absolute dollars, the United Kingdom may not be our single largest trading partner, but it does have one of the largest foreign direct investments into the Carolinas. Joining us now from the United Kingdom, Her Majesty's Council, uh, Her, Ma Her Majesty the Queen's Consul General, Annabelle Malins. Uh, and having trouble with titles, Annabelle. Thank you for going along with me, uh, and welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, uh, Annabelle. Let's, let's start. You know, one of the, one of the big issues for a couple of years now has been Europe, and has been the uncertainty and what's going on in the eurozone and the European economy, 
And early on, the United Kingdom took a lot of heat for not putting their arms uh, further around adopting the euro. And mm -hmm. it seems like that probably economically was not just the right thing for the UK, but the right thing for the eurozone at the time. It looks like a dodge, a bullet that was dodged by the UK. It's kind of characterized now where you all are in your own austerity measures. Mm -hmm. And as you look across the pond to the United States, how mm -hmm. that impacts the way that you look at your direct investment into the Carolinas and into the U.S.? Mm -hmm. Well, we have been very concerned about what's been happening in the Eurozone, not least because it's actually a destination for 40% of our exports, and we're a big trading nation. Um, and of course, it has had an impact on business confidence domestically for us, but also globally. And because of our global connections, that matters too. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of feedback um, which affects our own economy. Um, we've been, you know, really encouraging our um, European neighbours in the Eurozone to get to grips with, you know, the key issues, uh, including building a firewall to protect the more vulnerable economies in Europe. And I think there's been a, a good measure of progress. There's still, you know, more mileage to go. And I think you know, part of the agenda um, for Europe is actually to look at their growth agenda, which is one of the things we've been very focused in on domestically. Um, in respect of our, um, our very successful relationship with the United States and um, with the Carolinas, uh, I think it makes it more important than ever um, that we helped our companies to explore the opportunities of this, um, this part of the, um, the United States economy. And certainly, you know, I characterise it when I talk to British businesses as being a, a real, you know, growth engine within the United States. And I've seen um, many British businesses looking much more seriously now at, at this region than they, uh, which may have been overlooked in the past. Is there, is there some fiscal advantage? Is there some competitive advantage now with the way that the world economies are and the way the US economies are for, for Britain to look a little bit harder at maybe even a larger investment here? We are already each other's largest investors and one of the, um, one of the discoveries, if you like, for me in, in getting to know more about the relationship between the UK and the United States is just how significant that relationship is. And we have, um, you know, British investment here in the United States provides about a million jobs and we benefit um, to the same extent um, in the UK. And for our businesses, you know, in operating here in the United States, um, there's a, a lot of comfort in the, the strength of the legal regime um, in terms of intellectual property protection and so on. Uh, some of the risk factors that can still be um, difficult to overcome in some of the emerging economies, um, you know, don't don't factor in, um, you know, to the in the same way by doing business in the United States. And another interesting aspect of this part of the United States is the opportunity that it's bringing some British business to explore the Latin American emerging economies. And I've seen, um, you know, companies mm -hmm. do just that uh, as an early part of their growth within this economy. Mm -hmm. Annabelle, a question I already, already know the answer to mm -hmm. because you've been helping us plan for a visit by more than 100 business and political leaders to London in May. Uh, what can we here in the Carolinas learn from London on a visit like that? Um, I think what you'll find is, is a city and a country that's incredibly globally connected. And for us, that's been a real um, aspect of our resilience um, through the recession. Uh, you'll find uh, a very multicultural, uh, very creative city. And I hope that you'll get the opportunity to visit Tech City, which is one of the, to me, you know, quite um, you know, stunning success stories of uh, a tech cluster starting off really small, maybe about 20 companies or so just in 2005. Now it's mushroomed up already to become one of the largest tech clusters in Europe. I think the number of companies certainly in excess of 250 uh, it includes, you know, some of the big tech companies like Cisco, Intel, Google, all the big names, mm -hmm. but also a lot of really dynamic, creative startups uh, across the um, creative technology uh, sectors. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the father of two young daughters and actually was, uh, uh, had the ability to, to uh, introduce them to, to Governor Haley not that long ago. And um, I really just had a question for you about the challenges maybe that you've faced as, as a woman in, in the diplomatic world and in your, in your role and in your position. Mm. 
Well, um, there are not enough women, I think, in um, certainly in the sort of more senior levels of diplomatic life, but it's something that um, my organisation, the Foreign Office, is very keen to address. And uh, I think the, the biggest challenge is one of the commitment to global mobility that one makes when you become a diplomat. So uh, I think um, success may rest less on the individual such as myself so much as having very exceptional families, including spouses and children that don't mind uprooting themselves and moving around the world. But um, it's an incredibly privileged position to have. Mm. Let's, get, let's back, get back to this, this issue of labor to some degree and talk about workforce development. When you, mm. when you talk to your um, colleagues, let me use that term, uh, UK owned or not, and you have dialogues about workforce development in the Carolinas, what are the biggest challenges to them getting what they need? Is it, is it the skilled labor? Is it the cost of labor? What, is it the policy around um, all of that and then some? What I'm hearing from British business is that it, it's around getting the, the right skill set and, um, and often, um, you know, that finding that they're having to bear the cost of providing the, I would call it the sort of the middle skills, mm -hmm. middle, middle range skill set um, to actually provide for the, um, you know, demands of, of the particular production they're involved in. So, um, you know, sort of basic skills, fine, but actually what we're looking for now in a lot of the high growth sectors are really quite um, sophisticated skill set. It doesn't necessarily mean higher degrees and so on, but it may be, you know, high end welding skills or something, you know, sort of very special skills that are, uh, are more difficult to locate. Is, it, is, was, is that a surprise to them that they would not have to bear that cost or that they would have that a, a big of a, a trouble finding that? I think to a degree um, we have similar issues in the UK. Our government has uh, invested in, um, in apprenticeship schemes, working in partnership with business to help um, you know, reduce some of the burden on, on business in, in finding the right skill set um, for their manufacturing in the UK. Um, I think that's not something that they necessarily access so easily here. Mm -hmm. Annabelle, we're Pretty excited to be planning for hosting the Democrat National Convention mm -hmm. uh, later this summer. And we hope to leverage that to tell the Charlotte story, to create some jobs and investment uh, in our region. As London looks to host the Olympics mm -hmm. again this summer, uh, what are the legacy issues from your perspective that you'd like to see result? Well, London 2012, we're um, only a matter of days away now and I think excitement has um, has escalated considerably. We're, we're really proud of what's already been achieved in preparing for London 2012 and a very big part of the vision um, from the early days has been building a legacy which um, provides uh, a new environment for the local population including um, business. Um, to, for an area of the UK which had been in, um, you know, in requir required regeneration, um, but also to use the spotlight that London 2012 provides to allow people to take a fresh look at the UK. And so we hope that um, both online, um, you know, on TVs, but also by people being in London, they will rediscover what our country is about uh, and take a fresh look. Um, you know, we are a very sort of dynamic and creative nation and we hope people will get that impression from experiencing London 2012. No, it's, uh, it's neat. Actually, we uh, are, are involved as a supplier to, to London 2012, mm -hmm. um, so we're excited about that. In what, in what way? Um, actually, with, on the tennis ball side, yeah. um, they, uh, uh, our Slazenger brand is actually going to be it's the official ball of the Wimbledon Championships, and they're actually hosting the, uh, uh, the Olympics a few weeks later, uh, mm -hmm. so pretty, pretty exciting. And I think um, one of the things I've seen that's been uh, neat is using some of the historic uh, venues in England as part of this Olympics, so it seems like it's going to be a pretty um, historic uh, Olympics from, from that standpoint too, not just building a bunch of new uh, uh, stadiums to use. So I guess I'm curious too, just with, with your post and, and, and um, you know, being in the Southeast, being in Atlanta, has there been any, um, anything that you've been able to, to sort of help out with considering that the, the games were in 96 were in Atlanta? 
um, and, and London, you know, 2012. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly um, the, the groups that have been working on delivering London 2012 have tapped all the sources of, you know, sort of experience that they've been able to, you know, for many different aspects of the games. And I'm sure the DNC experience will be some, somewhat the same mm -hmm. um, to sort of understand the intricacies and the practicalities of, of hosting an event on that scale. Um, you know, we, we have, as you've mentioned, um, we've built a spectacular new Olympic Park. It's mm -hmm. all been delivered on budget. It's um, on time and, um, and on cost. And it's, it's given us sufficient time to go through the kind of pilot testing and draw on um, the expertise that other sister host cities have been able to share with us. And um, another sort of U US and tennis connection is that one of the visions for London 2012 is to give equal status to the Paralympics. And on the Olympic Park, we have a whole new um, wheelchair tennis facility, Eaton Park, which I think it was wheelchair tennis that was actually invented here in the States. Yes, yeah. yeah. No, wheelchair tennis is, is big and um, mm -hmm. definitely something that, uh, as a brand, we continue to try to get involved with. Uh, Annabelle, 2008, uh, 2008 fiscal, close to fiscal disaster. It was a fiscal mm -hmm. disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, not just the U.S., but certainly the U.K., Scotland, England, went through some pretty scary times when it came to whether these banks were going to make it through and mm -hmm. what would happen to the rest of our financial underpinning. Uh, what kind of progress, have you, let, let me ask it this way, do you feel like there has been the kind of progress we need to have in the reform of whatever banking was then and what it is now? Are we headed the right direction? Do you feel like we've gone far enough? I think it's been a very interesting learning opportunity. It's really highlighted um, to those you know, in the middle of, of the, you know, the banking industry, but also, you know, to the political world, mm -hmm. just how interconnected our financial systems are and the additional responsibilities that therefore puts on um, the regulatory system that we have, as well as on those that are taking the decisions within the institutions themselves. And so, you know, our, our government has certainly looked at that very deeply. Um, they have made um, changes which um, we believe have put, um, you know, London-based banks in, in a strong position. Um, you know, certainly um, we feel there's probably more work to do, but uh, it has been important to sort of tackle those issues and um, hopefully put us in a better place. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about the situation in the Eurozone and um, you know, stabilizing the banks in the Eurozone has been an important part of, of finding some calm, re reasserting some calm in the Eurozone. And I think, you know, too, with the sort of monetary um, loosening that the European Central Bank has deployed, that has been achieved to a large extent. Um, but, you know, it, there, there are still significant risks and I don't think we can, any of us, feel complacent about that. Um, but, of course, you know, moving away a little bit from the finance sector uh, and looking more at why we have this very sort of globalised financing system, um, um, you know, it is actually feeding a very successful global economy and, uh, um, and significant trade. I mean, just between the European Union and the United States, um, the trade between those two big uh, major economies accounts for 54% of global trade and so if we look to um, expand the trade between us we can have a very significant impact on our own economies in fact one of the um, things that we think it would be really worthwhile to look at in in the course of this year is the opportunities for agreeing a, a free trade agreement between the United States and the European Union which would you know knock into touch all the other free trade agreements put together because of the scale of the relationship that exists. Do you think there's some political spine and political will for that to happen? Absolutely. And it will need to, um, to touch on uh, a lot of sensitive issues. It, it'll require a lot of political courage. But the prize there when you know, we're all wanting to you know, really kind of push our economies out of the doldrums that we've been in is really significant. Um, thank you for being on the program. It, it flies by as it always does. Uh, I, I think, and this is just my personal opinion, I think the single best export 
from the UK right now is the PBS series Downton Abbey. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Have you watched that? Have you been? I have not. Oh, you're missing something. And I'm not being self-serving because it's PBS, but it really is good. <laughs> thank you for being on the program, Annabelle. Nice thank to see you, you, Chris. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Uh, Kai, good to see you. Welcome. Come on back, please. Absolutely. No, and Bob, always, always nice to see you. Good to, to be with you, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Until next week, I'm Chris Wooding. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton an international accounting tax and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health, including Presbyterian in Charlotte and Forsyth in Winston-Salem, are affiliate heart hospitals of the Cleveland Clinic, consistently ranked number one in the nation for heart care. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, proudly serving South Carolinians since 1946. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.